So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, I want to welcome you to breakout session B. Um, the presenters of this session are Hakeem Leonard, Nadira Mayweather, Emily Cole, and Jamil Muhammad. So during the first part of this breakout session, Hakeem will discuss empathy as both an action for everyday living and transformative pedagogy. Then Nadira will discuss, discuss the power of collaboration by incorporating the three L's, which are language choice, listening, and love into the spoken and written word as a framework for building a more inclusive community. During part two of this breakout session, Emily will explore the importance of leading with authenticity, utilizing civility principles, and leading with accountability. Jamil will then ex explore the potential blind spots, explore the potential blind spots um, to help us identify our own leadership. So thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll give the floor to Hakeem. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Hold on, I'm having a little trouble here. All right, can everybody hear me? Okay, great. So I'm actually on two different devices. So that's why I'm having a little trouble here. But um, so I'm going to share from one device and I've got my phone ready. Um, oh, I see that it says that uh, it's disabled from screen sharing. I'm not sure if I can. You should be good now. <laughs> that was my fault. OK, I'll try it again. Okay, great. Okay. So thank you all. Um, I wanna talk today uh, about transformative empathy. Um, and in doing that, oh, let me put you on speaker. In doing that, uh, we're talking also about unsettling dominant definitions of inclusion and belonging. Uh, so I think it's really important for us to have a foundational understanding of empathy from an intersectional place. Uh, and I think that's going to really give us um, opportunity to see our work differently and to see some of uh, even ourselves differently. So empathy can transform when we understand it from a, the place of belonging. And so the first thing I want to say is we want to unsettle a dominant conception of inclusion. And so a dominant conception of inclusion might be sometimes phrased this way. We value the ability for all people in our community to thrive and contribute regardless of difference. Um, and the reason why I'm going to give you a, you know, a picture, paint a picture for you. So you can imagine that this definition is created by somebody who's standing at the center, who's always been included. And they're saying, you can come be a part of regardless of difference, right? I don't have to work to see your difference. You just come join me, come join my party. Um, so this is actually not an inclusive statement at all. It's a non-discrimination statement, right? So it's, it's saying, hey, I'm not gonna discriminate you based on differences, but this does empower us to actually engage with difference. This doesn't empower us to have difference to shape us, right? And so that's, so we're trying to, we're trying to um, actually uh, decenter this dominant definition of, of inclusion and belonging. Uh, I don't know if you know who this is. Um, it's actually Eartha Kitt. Uh, I don't know if uh, anybody knows Eartha Kitt was a famous actress, entertainer. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, show, I'll tell you more a little bit why, of, why I'm talking about Eartha Kitt later. But from an intersectional place, the empathy comes from the idea of, of people of color and black people belonging to themselves. Uh, and that, that's rooted in embodiment. And so I, I don't want to give a technical definition of embodiment, but we're going to say but embodiment on a basic level is the congruence between our internal selves and ourselves in the world. And 
a lot of times when we talk about embodiment from a technical place, it's the connection of the mind and the body. We know that Western society has this very much this dichotomy between the mind and the body and things that are of the mind are more valuable and more worth more than things of the body. Um, and then this idea, of course, connected to this is disembodiment. Um, so to be separated from an experience of being wholehearted or feeling uh, whole within your body, whole within yourself. Um, and so just, uh, just really want to establish when we talk, before we even talk about empathy, we're talking about the importance of establishing belonging from this place of people who, people who have had to learn how to belong to themselves because the world did not, the world did not welcome them to be themselves, okay? Uh, so from an actual historical perspective in, in Black culture, uh, one of the first people to talk about this kind of thing was W.E.B. Du Bois in The Souls of Black Folks, 1903. You know, he talked about this double consciousness of how I'm trying to be an American and I'm trying to be black and they won't, you know, the society won't, it won't let, won't let me be fully myself in, in both of these ways. Um, and so this, this idea of um, embodiment, he, you know, he, he's almost saying I'm disembodied by the society around me. And uh, and so this this is uh, this is related to this theme of belonging to ourselves. If you fast forward to the Kambahi River Collective, you know this was a group of black lesbian women, uh, and they wrote a statement uh, um, that even before we had intersectionality coined as a term, this was one of the first things you heard that was rooted in an intersectional way, and they were saying, you know what? We, we are marginalized by the white feminist movement and we're also marginalized by black men and, and, the, and the civil rights movement. And we need to name all of ourselves, right? We need to, we need to define ourselves as a whole. This, you know, this, they can't represent me fully over here. They can't represent me fully over there. And so, it's this idea of they had to remember themselves. And you see that sometimes in the, in the literature talking about with black people and black women, it's this putting ourselves back together, this belonging, um, this way of belonging to ourselves, this way of embodying ourselves. Uh, and so to give you a technical, so this is, of course, we in society, we talk about the golden rule. Um, love people as you love yourself or value people as you value yourself. Um, but what happens when we teach empathy from a place of privilege? Uh, you know, if you value people as you value yourself and you've always stood at the center, then how do you value me when, I've, when I'm not at the center? You know, you can't value me. <laughs> you can't, you don't know how to value. Um, and so when we come from that golden rule, we're saying, I know how to love because I know how to love myself. You know, I value you as a value myself, but that doesn't work when, when we've always stood at the center of things. So the platinum rule, Milton Bennett, he's an inter intercultural researcher. He talks about the platinum rule, love people as they love themselves, value people as they value themselves. And so we ask another question, what happens when we teach empathy from a place of those who have had to remember themselves? We don't say, I know how to love. We actually, we, we take a place of curiosity. We say, how do I love? So this, this rule actually, actually empowers us to be curious, you know? And so now we're, we're getting into how does this relate to empathy, right? And so when people have had to remember themselves and embody themselves, we have, and then it, definitely when the, you talk about the Kambahi River Collective and they said, no, this is who we are. You, you, nobody's given us a place of belonging. So this is who we're. We're saying this is who we are, and to come and be with us, you have to. You have to be curious and say, "How do I love?" And so that is a foundation for empathy. 
right? And so that's, the, I'm trying to give you a foundation for empathy from this intersectional place of people who have had to name themselves, take up their own space. Um, and so this question that we asked of, back to the golden rule of how do people, how, how can people say, you know, they'll love as they love, you know, I'll love you as I love myself, uh, but when I've been socialized into this dominant gaze. And so what do we mean by dominant gaze? It's almost this narrative that says, I'm standing at the center as the reference point, the definition of normal, my view, uh, uh, or your view gets, uh, my view gets to shape your, the definition of your belonging and, and your value grows as I view and recognize it. And so you cannot have somebody who's had this place of being centered, they cannot, they cannot really define what empathy is because you've stood at the center and you haven't had, and you haven't had to, to do that. You know, you've been viewing people from that place. Um, and so the dominant gaze cannot embody empathy without itself, itself as a reference point. Um, very important point. Um, and so, you know, where people have been vulnerable and have had to have resilience uh, that has led to this inner work and transformation, we need those people to be centered. We need the leadership of those people to have communities of empathy, to have communities of curiosity. They've had to take up, they had to take up their space. They've had to remember themselves. They've had to name themselves. Uh, and to talk about a, a quick point from critical race theory, this idea of centering in the margins that, um, so if, you, if you, you, you see what has been normalized, what has been normal, uh, and then there's things that have been more marginalized, we actually need to do, we need to purposely uh, let the things from the margins come to the center. Um, and so really quickly, um, I'm gonna play one minute of a song. Uh, and this, the reason I showed Eartha Kitt earlier is because Eartha Kitt has like this famous quote in which they asked her, will you compromise for love? And she was like, compromise? No, and, and, and then she was like, um, you know, I'm gonna love myself and somebody can share my love with me as I love myself. And so this is actually, uh, empathy says, I will, empathy says, I will share your value for yourself with you. Um, and so this is Jamila Woods, uh, an artist, and she has a, a, a album and on the album, she has this kind of intersection with other famous people. So her songs are represented by that. And this is a song called Eartha based on Eartha Kitt. Uh, and so I'll play just like a minute of it and you can hear that refrain of who's, who's gonna share my love with me for me. So just to reiterate uh, that point, while the golden rule might say, this is what we thought it meant to be empathetic. I'm gonna love you as I love myself. Actually, what, it, what, what 
it means more, more fully to be empathetic is this question, who's gonna share my love for me with me? And so, um, you know, to love people as they love themselves. Uh, and so I really uh, hope you got that. Um, and I wanna kind of end on Audre Lord. I don't know if y'all are familiar with her, but she was part of the Kambahi River Collective, but so many other writings as well. But she kind of, this quote really encapsulate, encapsulates the idea of people who have had to remember themselves and how that, that way of belonging to themselves should be the, when we define inclusion, we should define it from people who have had to, not people who stand at the center, but people who have had to name themselves, who have had to know what it meant to belong to themselves. And then, so therefore they know what belonging is and empathy is. And so she says, uh, those of us who stand outside the circle of society's definition of acceptable women, those of us who have been forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, we know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths for the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. And so I guess my point here is that uh, the way in which we have been looking, defining inclusion uh, is all is it's supporting the master's house <laughs> uh, because it's supporting those standing at the center, and we actually need to we actually need to dismantle that. Okay, and so uh, in conclusion, uh, here are the 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 main points. Um, we need to unsettle dominant definitions of belonging. Uh, black people, especially black women and other BIPOC folks have had to remember themselves. They've had to, uh, they've had to remember themselves and, and name themselves. Uh, empathy is rooted in valuing somebody's love for themselves. Uh, empathy is rooted in valuing differences, not similarities. And empathy and curiosity are needed now more than ever. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I don't know what's, uh, Veronica, what's the next step, but uh, I'll follow. I don't know if there's questions or if there's, we're going right into somebody else, but. Thank you so much for that. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to use the, the chat box just so we can um, stay on our time. But I believe we have um, uh, actually a little bit of time left because we're in here um, till 6.20. So um, I'll give anyone, like a minute or two if they wanna ask any questions or send them in the chat um, to talk with Hakeem. And then Adira, whenever you're ready, you can go and um, present as well. All right, wonderful. Can everyone hear me? Have I unmuted? Thank you so much, Dr. Leonard, for that. That was amazing. And the part where you were talking about naming yourself fits well into what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Y'all forgive me if I go pretty swift because um, I'm gonna try and cover a lot in a little bit of time. Um, so I do want to thank you all for being here tonight. So let's jump right into it. Um, Dr. Howard Bostik already kind of talked about our objectives. So I'll just say really what we're gonna talk about tonight is collaboration and ways that we could do that through listening, showing more love, um, and our word choice when we communicate. I'm going to talk a little bit about cultural responsive teaching and cultural competence, but all of that is based upon communication, right? How we communicate with each other um, in light of the ways that we're out on the margin and how we can bring ourselves back to the center, um, as Hakeem already, already mentioned. So we're going to talk about the congruence of importance of thinking, feeling, and behaving with consistency, genuineness, authenticity, authenticity, excuse me, and honesty towards others and what we're going to talk about tonight. So let's jump right into it. I am a big advocate of saying thank you. I want to thank you for your time tonight. I know that you could have chosen to be anywhere else. 
Um, but because you believe in this or because you're getting course credit or for whatever reason that has brought you to this screen tonight, I want to say thank you. I also wanna recognize that what I'm about to share for many of you may be things that you've heard already. I don't uh, profess to know your knowledge levels. Some of you may be novices, some of you may be experts. So forgive me if some of this information seems basic um, but I do believe that the fundamentals are important for us to master. So thank you, thank you, thank you um, for being here and for your patience if this is information that you already know and you can say, Nadira, I mastered that. All right, so let's talk about introductions. There are a lot of us on the line and we don't have time to go through and talk to everybody. And I apologize because I like to get to know people, but I do think it's important for you to trust in what I'm saying that you know a little bit about me. So without further ado, hi, my name is Nadira. Nadira, yep, that's my name. Three syllables, seven letters, but people mess it up 10 times just the same. I get called Nadira, Nadira, Nadria, Ladira, and Madir. So let me sound it out phonetically for you to hear. It's na dear uh. Think of dear, put na at the beginning and uh at the end. That's it, yep, you got it, my friend, Nadira. See, my name means precious, unique, rare. Sandra and Anthony, my parents, they actually chose it with great care. So it's not that I'm vain, and I won't judge you if your pronunciation is unintentionally incorrect. I just ask that you try to pronounce it correctly because that's actually one of the highest forms of respect. It was given to me at birth, and it will be tied to me way beyond this life. When you speak it into the atmosphere, I'd like for you to speak it right. A name is a declaration spoken at least three times a day. So if you multiply that by 70 years, that's 76,650 times that I get to hear someone say that I am precious and unique, my reminder, my affirmation. So think about that the next time you attempt the pronunciation. I'm a cisgendered woman. My pronouns are her and she, and I am black mixed with black. My hair is all kinds of type 4C. I'm married to a handsome king, 10 years in July. Blessed on, blessed on, blessed one. Look at him, you'll see why. Two precious boys, so thankful to have carried and to have been seen, been born. One unborn baby was lost in between them and my heart is still mending from being torn. I'm a Detroit native, but I was raised in the GA. I'm a Motown peach, if you will, in the countries where I stay. On some Sundays, you can catch me in a pew, hands raised and singing loud, but my best communion with the Almighty comes in quiet times, outside in the earth, away from the crowd. I often, though, question who, what, when, where, how, why, seeking to know what life is all about. Some of this is probably just my liberal arts background coming out. Frequently, I am dancing or writing in one of the 700 planners I've created or acquired. I love pound cake poems and planner supplies. Nature often gets me inspired. I am flawed. I am pensive. I am insecure, sometimes defensive, but always looking, seeking to be more pure. An educator by trade and passion and a DEI warrior by day, semi-neophyte by day, I should say. A mom made cook, hot wheels connoisseur and laundry guru, guru at the house of May. This is me growing, learning, changing, evolving, reaching, but also just trying to stay sane. I'm Nadira, yep, Nadira, that is how you say my name. So I took that time for you to get to know me because we're gonna talk about relationships and the importance of saying a name knowing who you are, being able to address who you are and share that with others as a means of collaboration and communication. So let's back up first and start with some basics. Um, many people say, well, what is culture? I'm the director of the Cultural Center. There's lots of definitions that we can get into, but I liked this one that um, I found by Hofstede. And basically it just talks about culture as a way of life, um, that a group of people, behaviors, beliefs, values, and symbols that they accept generally without thinking about them and that are passed along by communication and imitation from one generation to the next. That communication piece is very important because if culture is passed down from communication, then we ought to intentionally think about the way that we communicate with others as a means to strengthen our cultural competence. So I really want us to hone in on that communication and the word choice and why we say the things that we say. So let's talk a little bit about cultural competence. Again, there are a number of definitions for cultural competence and things that go along with it. You may also hear that it's called multicultural competence or multicultural awareness, but there are some components that, that are important that look at our attitudes, our values, our biases, our assumptions. Basically, it's our ability to assess those things and how we view the world and others with, right? 
do you know the lens that you see the world with? If you looked at all the different layers that are sort of covering the lens that you view the world with, can you identify them? Can you assess them? Can you see what the blind spots are for you viewing the world or having a genuine relationship with someone else? Um, how much do you know about others and their experiences or the culture that they have? And then how do you apply that awareness or that sense of self um, in your day-to-day -day interaction with others? And the thing about cultural competence is to remember, you're not going to grasp all of it. The, the time that we have tonight is not nearly enough time for us to talk about all of it. So the key is that you're continuing to try to learn about it and to be patient with yourself and to be patient with others as you grasp this knowledge. So again, I said I'm an educator by trade. Normally I would love to do a KWL to know what you wanna know, what you know and what you learn, but we don't have time for that tonight. So just pretend that I ask you, well, what do you know about cultural competence? What do you wanna know and what at the end, um, ask yourself what you've learned. Um, so before we can go into all of that though, like I said, I wanna get back to the basics. I sort of named this the three L's. So when you're talking about cultural competence or building relationships with people or your cultural responsiveness, these things seem basic, but they are super important. If you don't master these things, it's hard for us to get all of the other theories and all of the other things that sometimes we hear. Language and, the, and the, the words that you choose are gonna be very important, right? Your ability to listen and to actively listen shows how you care for others. Um, and it allows you to build bridges and not to have walls up between you and other people. And then love for me, regardless of what people believe, regardless of what um, identities you share, love is a common thread. It's a common language that everybody can understand. You are either loved or you feel lack of love. And I think that it is all something that we can wrap our brains around. And so rec recognizing how to love yourself and then being able to share of yourself with others. So let's jump into it. Uh, your word choice or choosing your words. One thing is that you have to be intentional about the things that you say. Um, we've seen lots of mishaps where people say, well, I didn't mean it. Um, and that's because we do need to take the time to think about the things that we're saying because words do have power. Many of you in your roles as educators or directors or uh, faculty in your different areas, you're responsible for messaging and content that you send out. And so it's important that you review that, have it reviewed with a second set of eyes to see if the language or the word choice that you're using is inclusive. Are you staying away um, from re relating to one specific gender or one specific culture? Are you, are you being inclusive in, in the messaging that you're sending out? Um, and can people see themselves? And when I see, I don't mean like your physical ability to see because I'm not, I'm not limiting people with out that ability. I'm talking about metaphorically. If I, as a black woman, can I see myself in the language and in the imaging are you using? If someone with mixed abilities, can they see themselves represented? Can they hear language that might be important to them represented in the way that you've written the content that you share? Um, so it's very important that you're intentional to look three and four and five, maybe even more times at the content that you're sharing. Have um, people from multiple backgrounds review the imaging and the messaging that you're sending out to make sure that you're trying to be as inclusive as possible. So it's very important for you to be in, in, inclusive and intentional. The other thing is that if you mess up, it's okay, right? If you've done all of that and you still don't get it right, that's a part of being human, but admit it and then correct it, right? We can't have positive communication that moves forward. If you have people that say, well, you know, I'm gonna take my hands off. I don't, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to do it, uh, but it's just gonna stay that way. No, if you mess up, admit it and then correct it and, and ask what's the appropriate way to go back and address that. So choosing your words is very, very powerful. It's very important. And the other thing is how do you use your words? How do you use the language, right? I started out talking about names. What do people prefer to be called? And I know, again, I know this is basic, but the, the times that I can tell you I've seen it messed up on the highest level to the highest degree, um, it's because people don't ask for clarification. Make sure that you're asking people how to pronounce their names, how it's spelled, what are their pronouns, what, how do they want to be addressed. Even when it comes to cultural um, references, don't just assume that because you have a friend that may be okay with being called Hispanic, another one might prefer to be called Latinx. You know, you have to ask each individual person. And the other thing with that is, is don't group everyone together. Ask on an individual basis, basis for verification just to make sure that you're clear. 
The other thing when it comes to using words and communication is your body language. What are you saying or not saying? So if your arms are crossed all the time, when you're interacting with somebody, that doesn't welcome a sense of openness. If you want to be closed off, do it. But think about the things that you're not saying when you're presenting to people or having communication, um, because what you don't say can be just as powerful as what you do say. And then there's a wonderful book that we use um, in our bridge program called On Course by Skip Downing that just sort of talks about ways that we can uh, respect cultural differences. So I already alluded to the pronouncing of the names, your nonverbal behaviors, not seeing people as um, stereotypes, but as individuals, and then microaggressions. How many by show of hands with your reactions have trainings on your campuses about microaggressions, right? We, we, we would think at this point in the world that we are um, not committing them, but we commit, in them, we commit them all the time. And sometimes we do that without even knowing it. So doing your best to avoid uh, microaggressions. And then as many of us are tonight, advocate for respect. You can be advocates for someone else. So if you see something taking place, stand up for that person um, and be an advocate. The other part of this is just caring, um, is active listening, right? Sometimes, and I am guilty of this, we are quick to listen, but we've already got our responses formulated, or we're quick to think that we know because we've got X, Y, and Z student who was in that same situation, and so the same thing applies. Again, this goes back to treating people as individuals. Always listen to understand, especially where cultural competence is concerned. You want to make sure that you're understanding the circumstances and scenarios that people are coming from, that your mind is clear and you're silent. Frequently with my students, I have an open door policy, but if it's one of those situations where I know that I can't give them my full attention, I'll say, let's schedule a time to where we can sit down and we can talk about this because I want to hear what you have to say. It's okay to be honest and transparent about where your listening level is at that moment. And people value when you give them the time. So make sure that your mind is clear and it's silent and you, you're giving them the active, active time to listen. Make sure you're asking to expand or clarify and then reflect, right? Part of listening is what happens after someone has shared something with you. So go back. I'm a note taker. Go back and review your notes. Sit down and ask yourself, well, what do they mean? Are there other clarifying questions that I need to ask so that I can get more information about that? Um, so in all of this talk about word choice, even in, in caring and, and using and choosing, it's important, this quote by Dr. Maya Angelou that said, I've learned that people will forget what you said People will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And I give her an honorary doctorate because she was so amazing. I think she should have had one. Um, and so that's why I say it that way. But they will always remember how you feel. So even if you've done your due diligence to select your words and to use them and choose them carefully, um, at the end of the day, years from now, if it didn't make them feel respected and feel like you cared, um, then, then it's not important. So I always just think about how you make a person feel. Um, and if I'm going too fast, I do apologize. I just, I just wanna make sure we honor our time. And then the next part is just about sharing that, that love component. So like I said, you first have to love and know yourself and that contributes to your authenticity, but how can one love themselves if they don't know themselves? And so a part of that is that, is that assessment. Sometimes you have to ask yourself, what is my story? What are the experiences or layered, layers of diversity that apply to me? Am I a cisgendered woman? I don't know. What does that mean? And do I have a background? What is my heritage? I don't know. What does that mean? You know, look it up. If you hear these terms and you don't know, don't be afraid to go and search these things and find out so that you can know what your story is. You can never have an appreciation for someone else's story or diversity or cultural authenticity until you know what your own is. The same is true for your blinders. You have to do assessments to find out what your blinders are or what are the things that would prevent you from clearly hearing someone else's story. So you have to do that assessment first and be honest and authentic so that you can share your story and that you can share with others and, and, and learn from them. Um, and a lot of that comes from self-reflection, sitting down to ask yourself, okay, what went well this day with my interaction with people that were unlike me? What didn't go well? What do I want to do the next time? So constantly be learners who are always self-reflexive, re always engaging in self-reflection. Um, and then this just sort of talks about, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but the, the, the layers of diversity and the lenses that we have, all of these things that you see, you know, we can see 
ethnicity and race and age sometimes on the outside and, and think that we know. Um, but there's all these layers about yourself and about others that you don't know. So we have to think through, those are the lenses that we see the world through. Those are the lenses that other people see the world through. And then we're trying to come together to help understand each other. So it's important to make sure that you understand layers on both sides so that you can help come um, to an appreciation for the lenses that both you and the other person have. And then real quickly, because I know we're almost at time. So there's a concept called culturally responsive teaching. Dr. Howard Bostick shared with me that many of you are educators um, and that you are training to be educators. And so it's important when you go into the classroom that you do have culturally responsive um, teaching when you go into the classroom, that you're thinking about including your students' cultural references in all aspects of learning. But you can't do that until you know what your layers are. So it's important that once you understand those things about yourself, then you can go and appreciate those layers for your students. And so certain ways that you can do that is thinking about perspectives from the parents and their families, communicating high expectations. All students are high achievers. Um, we shouldn't be boxing people into different categories and communicate those high expectations to those students. Think about your instruction and the way that you're infusing um, cultural examples so that as um, uh, Dr. Leonard said, we are bringing the people in from the margins so that that's the story that's being shared, not the centralized dominant story that has been shared for years. For those of you that are on higher education, uh, campuses. There's a tri-sector practitioners model by Toby Jenkins that's presented that just talks about community building and outreach, your administrative practices and cultural programming. And for those of you that are running cultural centers, these are just some ways on the side of things that you can think about to make sure that people can see themselves in the centers and the places and spaces that you're creating. So I know that I'm kind of at my time, just sort of sharing my sources with you. If there's more information that you want to learn, I'd be happy um, to have that so that we can uh, answer any questions that may be have. So hi again, my name is Nadira Nadir, uh, and thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you so much. I think I can speak um, on behalf of everyone that was very empowering and I really appreciated you going over those concepts because I think that sometimes they can get a little misconstrued. So going over those and making sure everyone um, is understanding of them is really important. Um, so thank you guys so much for being here for our first half of the section. There actually is going to be a Q&A later. So if you do have questions, um, we have like another minute or two before the next start. So if you want to ask them now, go ahead. Um, but if not, and you want to put them in the chat, I'll make sure to get them to Dr. Howard Bostick and they can be used for the Q&A portion um, later in the evening. So um, yeah. And so 625, I believe, is the start time for the next presentation. So we do have a few minutes, but I want also want to make sure Nadir and Hakeem have time to get into the other uh, session. So <laughs> if there's any like super quick questions, but if not, like I said, please throw them in the chat and then I will make sure to get them to Dr. Howard Bostick. Oh, and thank you, Hakeem. He put his um, email in the chat. <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing anything. So thank you again, Nadira and Hakeem um, for being here. And like I said, we can get any of the questions you guys might think of and um, get them over to be discussed later for the Q&A portion. Thank you, everyone. All right, welcome Jamil. I'm seeing you and I'm trying, oh, and there's Emily, awesome. No, wow. both co-hosts really quick so you guys have access to share your screens. And I'll share mine for mine and Jamil's. Perfect. Oh, it's easier. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, well, since you guys are both here, um, I don't see any reason we can't just get started. So again, um, hopefully if there's any like quick questions at the end and we have time before the next portion, um, feel free to ask those questions, but like I said, throw them in the chat and um, we can discuss them at more length later. So thank you guys so much. And Emily, uh, off to you. So thank you. All right. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Can you all do a wave so I know that you can kind of see my screen? Okay. Looking good. All right. 
I am honored to be here. I'm going to speak to you about civility and authenticity in leadership. Um, so my name is Emily Cole. I'm the Chief Development Officer of Lifting As We Climb LLC. Um, we've got our website there and our Instagram. And um, I have my email address at the end of my slides. And um, that was a great idea to put it in the chat. Should have done that in the other group. So I will do that here as well. Um, so we're just very grateful for the opportunity to be here with you today. Lifting As We Climb is a black owned educational consulting firm. Uh, we specialize in anti-bias, anti-racism practices, trainings, and teachings. We work in schools, communities, private organizations, and directly with parents and students. Um, we take a bit of a different approach where we broadly define an educator as someone who shapes the minds of young people. That is anyone involved, a teacher, a coach, a parent, a sibling, counselor, business owner, a friend. Um, I'm a Shepherd alum, so I'm especially pleased to be here. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. So here we go. Okay. So today I'd like to contribute to the conversation you all have been having around fierce leadership um, and discuss civility and authenticity. Leadership is a skill. It is a lifestyle. It is not a job title. It is not something you attain or achieve. It's something you build and grow. Anyone can be a leader in the right conditions and we move in and out of leadership roles depending on the setting every single day. Two pillars of leadership that I'd like to talk about are civility and authenticity. Um, we'll explore ways to lead with accountability and begin to grow our stamina and understanding for how to engage courageously. So this quote, I think, pretty much sums up everything I'd like to share, which is success is liking yourself, liking what you do, and liking how you do it. So the how you do it is really where I'm focused today. Let's get into it. An authentic person is one who is true to one's own personality, spirit, or character. Um, there are three key tenets for embodying authenticity in your leadership capacity that I'd like to talk about. Vulnerability. Recognize your own shortcomings and be honest with yourself and with those that you lead. It's really important to break down those walls that we put up um, where we tend to try and hide our core because that's where we really need to do the most work. Um, so try to work through that. Consistency. You cannot be a different version of yourself depending on where you are. You need to hold true to your core morals and values no matter the setting or circumstance. And accountability. Hold yourself accountable when you betray your core values and beliefs. Um, and this circles back to vulnerability, be open to correcting your behaviors and growth. This is all central to relationship building, which as you know, as leaders is key in any leadership capacity that you find yourself in. You need to foster depth among your peers and those you lead in order to really grow in your leadership. So balance your foundation or your entire structure collapses. Apply those authenticity principles, no matter where you are and no matter who is around. If you deviate from your core self in front of one group, then your platform of who you are and most importantly, who you want to become, it not just as a leader, but as a human, it can crack and collapse. So pay attention to that. Okay, I'd like to spend a little bit of time here. Civility. Civility is claiming and caring for one's identity, needs, and beliefs without degrading someone else's in the process. It is not setting the tone. That is called tone policing. That is a personal attack and a tactic for criticizing a person for expressing emotion. It distracts and derails the discussion from the critical message that person was trying to convey with you. Tone policing is inappropriate behavior. We control our own expressions, emotions, and rules for engagement, but we have no right to define those principles for other people. 
Civility is not making assumptions. We as a society, as you know, are quick to judge based on appearance, based on tone, based on topic, based on our lived experiences. And we miss out on opportunities when we assume opportunities to deepen our understandings, challenge our assumptions, create new lived experiences, foster connections, and grow. Do the work to remove your biases. Civility is not proving a point. It is impossible to build common ground if you assume you already know the solution to a complex problem. If you listen just to prove a point, you entirely miss out on what the person you've engaged with is trying to communicate with you. And these, you need to erase these errors from your leadership or you risk permanently damaging your relationships and alienating your allies and supporters. It is hard to follow a leader who is not able to work through what civility is not. So I have some advice on rules for engagement. Center authenticity, hold true to your morals and your beliefs. Decenter yourself, decenter your assumptions, your walls, your biases. Speak your whole truth every time. Recognize the importance of your lived experiences and what you need to share, what you wish to share, what you bring to the table. Your truth and your message are important and your words matter. Value vulnerability. A lot of leaders struggle with this one, but vulnerability is beautiful. It opens you up to a whole new world of depth and opportunity. Don't underestimate this gift. It's a critical way for you to engage with someone that you'd like to connect with. Stay open and engaged. Push back against those internal biases and internal flight or fight responses that you might have during a difficult conversation. Challenge yourself to actively listen and experience even and perhaps even most importantly when it's uncomfortable. So what is courage? Courage is the mental or moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand danger, fear, or difficulty. It takes courage to engage and lead with civility and authenticity. It takes courage to be vulnerable. So how do we do that? How do we lead courageously? Well, you need to hold true to your authentic self. Open dialogue. Remove your preconceptions and assumptions. Check them at the door every single time. Actively listen. This is trust building. Continually practicing active listening fosters connection. So this is a journey, right? Marathon, not a sprint. Maintain your civility principles. Authenticity, vulnerability, honesty, integrity, and respect. You wanna be able to look in the mirror at the end of the day and recognize yourself. You wanna be proud of how you maintained your principles, no matter the experiences you moved through throughout the day. Connecting with respect. So how do we move forward? Like I said, this is a process. It's a skill. So dedicate the space, energy, and resources to that. Give yourself grace to make mistakes. Build your stamina for open and honest communication. Hold yourself accountable when you do make those mistakes. It is no one else's job to do it for you. Value yourself enough to practice this. Expect and accept non-closure. This is another one that leaders tend to struggle with sometimes. There is no perfect format for building common ground. There's no perfect way to engage and lead with civility and courage. Remove the fallacy of perfection. It constrains you from true growth and being open to those opportunities to connect. So the final thoughts that I'd like to leave you with have the courage and the fortitude to honor who you are, no matter where you are. Engage in dialogue to raise 
all boats. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Um, I'm gonna keep sharing my screen because I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share Jamil's presentation. And then um, I think we should have time for questions, but it was an honor, so thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. And I think you brought up a really great point because I feel like when you talk about leadership, a lot of people don't go to the words vulnerability and openness. And I feel like those are such important things to talk about. So thank you so much for that. Um, and we can just move right along to Jamil's presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, all right. Thank you. And thank you so much for having us this afternoon. I, I really am grateful and, and so appreciative for the honor to uh, have these few minutes with you. Uh, but I want to just talk a little bit about this afternoon, flaw management and blind spots to success. Flaw management and blind spots to success. So who am I? I'm Jamil Muhammad. I'm a facilitator at Lifting As We Climb. And that title facilitator means that I know how Emily takes her coffee. I know how Nasser takes his coffee because I'm the guy that has to make the coffee runs. I facilitate things at Lifting As We Climb. But my contact information is on that slide. If you need it later, we'll resupply it to you. But let's go right into our topic, building the beloved community from the beautiful mosaic building the beloved community from the beautiful mosaic. Those two phrases, beloved community and beautiful mosaic may be familiar to you uh, from you news junkies and history buffs. You may notice that the beloved community is a quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King about how people can begin to form associations and relationships that would foster human development. The beautiful mosaic comes from um, the historic mayor of New York City, the Honorable David Dinkins. And Mayor Dinkins talked about the fact that New York provided him as the leader of that city with a beautiful mosaic of human resources from which to draw to create a better New York in the future. But whatever we're going to do, building that beloved community from that mosaic is going to require fierce leadership. And what we mean by fierce leadership defined for us by Dr. Shaquita Howard Bostick is the leadership that causes us to be flexible enough to handle changes without being so liquid that we fall and just get absorbed into the sand. We've got to have some roots, but we've also got to be able to flex with those roots so that we don't snap in the winds of change. So fierce leadership is the leadership dedicated to the success of the individual, the team and the organization. Fierce leadership is unafraid leadership. Fierce leadership is bold leadership, but fierce leadership is also compassionate leadership, vulnerable leadership. It's authentic leadership, honest leadership, respectful leadership. And those are the things that we'll talk about today. So let's go to our next slide. We see that what some failures are that leave us open to blind spots. When we first got this topic, I thought, hmm, blind spots. But the more I thought about it, read about it, and researched about it, blind spots can be very dangerous. No less a figure in the world of auto racing than the great Mario Andretti. Mario Andretti, the Formula, car, Formula One car uh, racer, car driver. Mario Andretti talked about how <laughs> blind spots can kill you, even on the Formula One track with those cat quick uh, reflexes that they have, those gentlemen had accidents. Those ladies, Janet Guthrie, others, they had accidents because of the blind spots. How can we eliminate our blind spots? Well, first we have to know what they are and they all deal with failure. The first word in each of these five bullet points that we'll make very quickly is failure. A blind spot is a failure, but a failure need not exist forever. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Failures happen. And you've heard about it so many times, how Babe Ruth struck out more than he made home runs. You've heard that talked about, how everybody has to come back from failure. It's a failure of the fight plan of Muhammad Ali for Joe Frazier to put a left hook on his chin, but it happened. Now, we're not going to get into sports. Like I told the other group, sports is a digression. We're not going to do it because it takes us away from the serious matter that we have here at hand. The first blind spot is a failure to grasp how others perceive us. People have a perception of you. They form it as soon as you walk in the door. 
as soon as you encounter them. Learn how your perception affects the people that you'll be dealing with and act accordingly. Don't have to change it. You're still going to be authentic. You're still going to live in your truth, but you have to understand how the perception that people have of you based on their preconceived notion or their lived experience with you affects the way they deal with you. If we don't do that, we fail. It's a blind spot. Number two, the failure to learn the lessons of our mistakes. We're all going to make them. But if we don't learn the lessons of our mistakes, we are vulnerable to make those same mistakes again. And when we do make those same mistakes, we then hurt ourselves as an individual, our team and our organization. And so, and Veronica is willing to say this and she does, she goes into it with us in terms of the way leaders have to be flexible. They have to be organic. They have to expand and contract according to the situation. You can't do that if you're not acknowledging and learning from your mistakes. Blind spot number three, failure to guard against the twin demons. I call them the twin demons of mediocrity and complacency. Mediocrity and complacency, what terrible demons they are. Mediocrity is not the thing that you can aspire to because it just happens. You don't work to qualify yourself for mediocrity. Nobody's ever given an interview. What do you want to do in life? I'm going to be as mediocre as I can, Sam. I'm going to do the best I can to be average as hell. Nobody says that because it's not something that you aspire to. Complacency is dangerous in yourself, in your organization, in your team. Why? Because to accept and become satisfied with the way things are means that you never envision how things can be. I'm not going to rehash the famous quote by Robert Kennedy, but you know the, the quote that Robert Kennedy said. Some people see what is not and ask why. Or see, yeah, they see what, you know the quote. He's saying, why not, right? Let's do it. Please don't write me from the Kennedy Family Foundation. You know, I had the quote together. But that's the idea. You've got to be able to look at the yet undone and see a way and a reason and a purpose to do it. Number four, failure to rise above emotions into the thinking of a fierce leader. Interesting. Fierce leaders have emotions, but they are not ruled by them. They are able to think. They're able to apply logic and reason to emotion and then bring forward a solution that brings the best outcomes and results. If we don't rise above our emotions, we get caught up in our limbic system, floating around in our amygdala always worried about anger and fear and, 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 and joy and happiness. We are titillated by our emotions and people who have that happen to them can never be said to be leaders. The fierce leader rises above emotions. That's a blind spot if we don't do it. And lastly, the failure to recognize the limits of one versus the leverage of many. The limits of one, the leverage of many. I believe it was the billionaire J. Paul Getty who gave the quote one day, he said that he would rather have the outcome of 1% of the outcome of the labor of 99 other men flowing toward him in a collective and cooperative relationship than to have 100% of his own labor. Because the teamwork, the empathy, the cooperation, the esprit de corps, if you will, produces a situation where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The whole, I say it again, is greater than the sum of its parts. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Because when the whole is acknowledged by each of the parts, each part rises to the occasion to make the whole and their vision come true. If you don't see it, it's a blind spot. And as a leader, you can't deal with just a, a collection, a motley crew of individuals. You've got to realize you're dealing with an entire organization, a team of folks to make things happen. Now, how can we manage the inevitable occurrence of flaws in all their forms? They're going to come up. Flaw is a mark or a fault or other imperfection that mars a a substance or an object. When a flaw is found, it makes that object less than ideal or perfected for the use for which it was created or a manufactured. So we have to understand that in our organizations, even in ourselves, I mean, and, and it's tough, it's tough. 
it's tough to think that there's an aspect about you that's not perfect. I mean, I know that's an abhorrent concept, but just, just bear with me for a second. It may be true that even you are not perfect in every way. Nothing in nature is flawless, not even that flawless diamond. Nothing in nature is really perfect. But what we do is acknowledge and expect flaws and we calculate them into the formula for our success. You calculate flaws. In our organizations, flaws cannot be allowed to exist. They'll occur, but we'll not allow them to stay a part of what we do for any longer than necessary. Because to resolve flaws, to take a flaw out of circulation as a factor against the collective goal of our self, our team, and our organization is the ability to rise into success. But we have to do that by acknowledging that, hey, you can't have a flaw, just stay here and become a part of our culture our academic culture at this institution or that. Some of us are educators of young children, early childhood educators. We can't allow, allow flaws to become a part of what we do. If you'll allow me to editorialize for a few seconds, we cannot train up a better future if we're continuing to burden the future with the problems of the past. We cannot allow flaws, they can't stay. Thirdly, we have to correct flaws in the strictest of confidence but announce excellence from the highest mountaintop. What do you mean that, by that, Brother Jamil? What I mean is that in a human to human experience, we don't deal here at Lifting As We Climb with the culture of cancellation. We consider ourselves the culture of correction. We don't deal here with annulment, we deal here with adjustment. When you do that, you can adjust and correct in the private circumstance that allows for the person to learn their lesson and then come back out to be great. If a student has persistent difficulty or a pupil has persistent, di persistent difficulty with a particular educational concept, however simple it may be, you could crush them as an educator saying to them, Johnny, you'll never get long division. You'll never get it, Johnny. I don't even know why you think you want to be a plumber because you have to compute numbers to be a plumber. You should go where and be a street sweeper, Johnny. That could crush the poor boy. But if you bring him into private, teach him what he needs to know and send him back out, who knows what the limit could be. Number four, learn to incorporate flaws while they yet exist in your group. Play hurt. Now I'm not gonna digress into a bunch of sports because that would be a digression away, would be a diversion away from what we're doing. This is a serious business here. But in the sports world, you got to learn to play hurt. Some of you boxing fans, I see Wendy's a boxing fan. She likes boxing. Okay. But in the boxing world, you remember how Muhammad Ali had to lean on the ropes in Zaire against George Foreman. That was due to a flaw in Muhammad Ali's conditioning. He understood that that's, that tropical air may sap all his strength. So he leaned on the ropes and absorbed an inordinate amount of punishment, creating a style called the rope-a-dope. But the rope-a-dope was successful because it incorporated his flaw into his plan for success. Are we able as fierce leaders to incorporate the flaws of ourselves, our teams, and our organizations into the plan for our success? If we can do that, even our flaws will work for us. The great poet, Nikki Giovanni, who's the uh, tenure professor now at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia, Nikki Giovanni wrote a poem years ago called Ego Tripping. She said, I'm so, so divine that even my mistakes are correct. I said, well, you go, girl, you, you just go ahead on, baby. See, that means that she understood that everything, even the imperfect worked, for the cause of the greater good. That's how fierce leaders lead their organizations. They understand that even the wrong works for the right if the wrong is controlled by the right, okay? So finally, let's make our flaw management a drawing card for excellence. What do you mean by that, Jamil? Let's make our flaw management a drawing card for excellence. Sure, because the way you manage flaws in your organization the way that you correct problems, the way that you adjust 
for deficiencies, the way that you then continue toward the goal despite the obstacles, you meet and overcome any obstacle in your path, that creates a reputation for you. In whatever circle you are relevant, and those circles I believe will expand, you're all leaders on this line. You're all leaders and most of you are leaders in the academy. You deal in the profession of education, the most noble of all professions. When you look at the word educate, it comes from the Latin, the word ducare, the verb ducare to lead is the actual root word. The prefix e or ex, out from. See, when you're leading out, you're leading a people out of darkness. You're leading children out of the darkness of ignorance. You're leading people out of being uninformed and illiterate into the light of the possibilities of their future. You can't do that if you're not fierce. You have to stand up and say, I manage flaws over here. And then the thing that will happen is on the next slide because your organization will be great. And guess what? Great organizations attract great people. Yes, great organizations attract great people. Blue chip players, again, not going into sports, but I got to say it. Blue chip players want to play for the New York Yankees because they have 26 or 27 world championships. So people who are working to hone their craft, to sharpen their expertise, to become great at what they do, they want to be connected with organizations that reward, foster, and create greatness. So great attraction, great organizations rather, attract great people. Create a great organization within your personal universe, your personal society, yourself. Create a great organization, then work to create a great team. Your intimate small number of people should be coordinated, should be working together, should be motivated. The spiritual tone should be elevated and people should be on the move. And when you do that, the organization that you're all connected with will be bit by the bug. They'll be caught in the contagion and you'll see people growing whether they thought they would or not because great organizations do attract great people and thus, the beautiful community that Dr. King talked about is built from the beautiful human mosaic that Mayor Dinkins talked about. But you and I, we are the missing link. We're the secret ingredient. We're the pinch of this and just a dash of that that gives a certain je ne sais quoi. We are fierce leadership. Fierce leadership makes the difference and you and I can do that. I'm so grateful for Dr. Shaquita Howard Bostic allowing us to be here with you tonight. We're going to open up the floor for questions if, when the time comes, because we have to declare it. We have to affirm it. We are indeed fierce leadership. And fierce leadership is who we're going to be. So pop your collar, brush off your shoulders, and walk tall. Put a little glide in your stride. Might even have a little dip in your hip. But walk tall toward a future that's going to be greater than what you had in the past, because you've never seen the future. And we know the past is not something we want to go back to. All right? Let's make it happen. Thanks, everybody. We open the floor. Thank you so much, Jamil. I really loved that. And I really love what you said about creating a culture of correction instead of just cancellation, because I just feel like we're all, again, we're not flawless. And I think everyone's learning. And I think creating an environment where people can grow from their mistakes is super important. So thank you so much for that. Um, sure. Like Chiquita said, please put your questions and comments in the chat. It's really appreciated. And we actually, um, finished up a little early. So um, I wanted to give you guys a couple of minutes. If you guys had any questions for our speakers, please feel free to um, ask that now. And um, we can just do that in chat for a couple of minutes before we move on to the um, keynote. Okay. I put my email in the chat too. So if you're shy, don't want to even chat, send us an email and we're happy to share. That's right. And of course, Emily takes it with two creams, three sugars. I don't know how she does it. Though. I do, though. <laughs> I don't know how you knew that. <laughs> so yeah, any questions that you have, guys, you're, they're welcome. Um, I see one in the chat, I believe, is for you, Jamil, about elaborating on play hurt. 
Sure, Heidi, how are you? Uh, thanks for your question. Playing hurt is a tradition um, that <laughs> men of a certain age, <clears throat> all right, uh, who never get carded anywhere. We never get carded for any reason anywhere. But anyway, I'll complain about that later. But we came up in the old uh, playing hurt tradition. That means if the game time is on and you got a busted clavicle, you got to play. You have to incorporate the flaw of the busted clavicle into your plan for how you will compensate and yet achieve the victory at hand. Some of you may remember, it put a Y in the chat if you remember a great football player by the name of Johnny Unitas. If you remember Johnny Unitas, he was a Western Pennsylvania steel town guy. Paul, you remember him. Yeah, Nicole, that's right. Emily, of course. And, and Miss Jeffries and Stacy, everyone. We remember Johnny Unitas. Johnny U wore number 19 for the Baltimore Colts, wore the high top black football shoes, had his crew cut, and he was an all business type of guy. But Johnny Unitas was busted up all the time. How he won championships was that he played hurt. He played even when his fingers were splayed in different directions. He played even when his shoulders were dislocated during the game. Sometimes he had a shot of cortisone and sometimes he didn't, but he had the heart of a champion because he played hurt. Last thing I'll say about that, before he died, a few months before he died, I ran into Johnny Unitas in the airport in Baltimore. And I noticed him sitting alone by himself in a brown three-piece suit. And I went over, that's right, Heidi, perseverance. And I went over to Johnny and I said, Mr. Unitas, it's an honor to meet you. And I extended my hands to shake his hand. And he said, man, it's an honor to meet you too. He said, but I can't shake your hand. I can't move my arm. This one has limited motion. This one has none. Use a price for playing hurt for the wrong cause. And for the amusement of all the people where you give up your body and you end up with CTE and broken bones and invalidated limb usage, maybe that's bread and circuses. Maybe that's just the amusement of the masses. <laughs> but fierce leadership is a right cause. So you're gonna have to play individually, team and organizationally hurt sometimes, but you still gotta bring it. That's what fierce leadership does. Thank you. And if you have just one or two minutes to answer, um, someone else also sent a question. He says, how do we make room for flaws in leadership if those flaws are fossilized and destructive? Mm. We don't. <laughs> we don't. We don't make, if they're fossilized and destructive, they have to go. We don't have to hold on to everything. You don't have to hold on to the destructive uh, things that destroy your life. I don't know how true you believe it is, but you all movie fans, you all saw what's love got to do with it. Poor Tina Turner, she had to get away from old Ike because Ike was just too much. Ike had eaten whole cakes and singing songs that nobody wrote, and just running up and down, it was a mess. And Ike was destructive and corrosive and fossilized in his behavior. And even if she ever loved him once, she had to say, Ike, I got to go my way because I love you, but I love me more than I love you. You got to love you and your team and your organization and your cause more than you love the corrosive, fossilized interference of people who are throwing you backwards on the track. That's my take on it. Thank you so much, Jamil, and thank you again, Emily, for your presentations. I'm gonna send the Zoom to go back to the main um, room to go over the keynote address as well as the Q&A. Um, I really can't thank you both enough so much for being here. I loved your presentations and I'm very excited for the next portion of our um, evening. So thank you guys for being here. And like I said, please use the Zoom link to hop over to the other one. You'll have to leave this call in order to enter the other chat, so. Okay, we'll have to leave this one, okay. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks. See you soon. Bye.